Hey, it's Amber, and I thought before the start of the show, I'd remind you that this is a tabletop crowd episode with the host, Kristen, who you can find on Twitter at Kristen is no Jedi, and there's going to be some new music. <laughs> so here it is. You are listening to the right podcast. Just a new show, new, new music. All right, here we go. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tabletop Crowd. I'm your host, Kristen. Tonight, I have with me David, Charlie, and Ezra. We're going to be talking about their audio drama, Hand in Glove, which is crowdfunding right now. Uh, Before we get started talking about this exciting project, let's go around and introduce ourselves. David, can we start with you? Hi, my name is David Hanna. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and uh, I am the writer and creator of Hand in Glove, a queer baseball romance audio drama. Hi, my name is Charlie. My pronouns are he and they, and I am playing Javi in this podcast. Great. Well, thank you all for joining me to talk about this fantastic project. Um, I think I want to get started by asking you a question, David, can you tell us a little bit about what, what gave you the idea or the inspiration to start this project? Uh, so like all, th- all great podcasts and audio dramas, it started with a Twitter joke um, about uh, pitchers and catchers, which is such an obvious bad joke, but uh, you know, it, um, it, it came up and s- somehow we were joking around about the idea of a pitcher and catcher falling in love. And I was hanging around more and more of baseball Twitter, which if you've ever been around baseball Twitter, there's a lot of like baseball thirst going on on baseball Twitter (laughs) in like the best way. (laughs) It's, it's pretty fantastic, but that idea just kept swirling around in my head over and over and over again. And I really couldn't get beyond it. And then this is probably the first thing I've written in about 15 years. Wow. So um, just jumping into the project from there started, it, it really started to become this thing of this is a chance to talk about far more than just two two players falling in love. This was a chance to really look at baseball and being queer. (laughs) Yeah, that's very, that's very cool. Um, I do like that it started with the Twitter joke because believe it or not, I interview folks about, you know, RPG projects and a, a lot of the times it's, Hey, I said something on Twitter and the other person sitting here in this interview with me responded on Twitter. We should do that. And here we are six, 12 months later, having done, <laughs> having done the thing yes. we said we would do on yes. Twitter. <laughs> What's really sad is it took me 18 months, I think, to finally get this to where I felt like I could do yeah. auditions. It, it was weird. Um, it, it came in fits and starts in how I wrote this thing in a lot of ways. Sure. I, I think that that's probably true for design or obviously writers of like novels or books that that makes sense was there anything and we don't have to dive into writer's block too much unless you want to but is there was there any like specific hiccup or was it just that regular creative flow that came and went in a past life I did theater and uh I I have never written in a way that was predictable um Mm -hmm. Any play I ever wrote usually came out um, of my head in about two weeks, but it was sitting in my head for about nine months or so. Like it, it took a long time for me to ever sit down and then put something, type something out. Once mm-hmm. I started typing it out, I'd be done in you know a matter of weeks. This one, each scene took a while, um, mm-hmm. and I don't know. I think various life things happened, just getting in the way of of finding that time. But it, it came in clusters and fits, and and it's honestly just the way I've always written. Uh, which then the editing process was a much different thing for me because I haven't usually edited anything. 
Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I think that credit to you because at the time of this recording, it is summer of 2021. So if you made anything in the last 18 months, I think it's incredibly impressive <laughs> given what we've been going through. So kudos to you for that. David, I know you've done some actual plays, some tabletop storytelling, actual play podcasts, and we won't get into like too much comparison between audio dramas and actual plays. I'm just curious in how this creative process was different in either auditioning or creation than it was for when you did podcasts for like actual plays. Uh, This feels a whole lot like doing theater. It it really does. Um, With the caveat that you aren't, I mean, the, it's very similar to how I used to direct those things, except that when I directed theater or wrote theater, it was always visually. Mm -hmm. Um, I have to give huge credit to, and I've shouted them out a lot, Cole Burkhart, um, who consulted on the script, because after I wrote everything out, it was written in a pretty much a play format. Okay. And Cole went through and was like, you need to describe this this odd in audio you need to describe this point this sound has to you have to figure out how this mechanic's going to work and we and went through the whole script and it really took somebody going you need to look at how all of this works together and how it's supposed to sound um i think that's probably the biggest difference you know with tabletop it really just was react in the moment it was a lot like acting for me mm-hmm. And, and it was just building a character on the fly and trying to remember the things that went on. Like I, I don't, I don't plan when I play. Like I really right. don't. Just the way that I, I enjoy doing it. But with this, it required taking what I'd always been trained on, which is how are you going to compose a scene visually, and rethinking of how are you going to compose it for the ear. Yeah, that's a good point. I think I've only listened to one audio drama podcast and it had a lot of sound effects. And this show is is going to be even more of that only because the way it's written, we are, there's baseball scenes. I mean, there's real baseball scenes within the show. Yeah. So figuring out how we're going to make that work from a mm-hmm. design perspective, you know, it's it on top of, with the acting and figuring out the characters and all that, we've also got to figure out how we're going to sound design a baseball game. When, if you've ever watched a baseball game or listened to it on the radio, Mm -hmm. it's still pretty indistinguishable as to what's going on in a given moment, unless somebody's telling you. The challenge of that, I think, is is going to be one of the big things going forward. Are you going to have an announcer? We have one moment of an announcer, but um, we have a lot of... With a lot of internal dialogue going on within the baseball scenes. Oh, I like that. So we'll be able to kind of be inside the minds of the players. Yes. That's cool. That would make baseball more interesting. If I could hear what players were thinking, I might watch baseball. I don't know if you want that because we <laughs> did just have at the All-Star game, yeah. Liam Hendricks, <laughs> a notorious wild man mic'd up and not knowing he was mic'd and uh, saying oh. FGD it lie on live national broadcast television. <laughs> it was both horrendous from a broadcast perspective, yeah. but delightful and adorable from a baseball fan perspective. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was the greatest thing ever. So when it came time to kind of do an open call for auditions, what was that like for you? I honestly, I've really bottled it after a lot of, a a lot of sides and calls that I've gotten from audio dramas. It's very much, um, especially in the last couple of years, audio drama has really built things similarly to how I've seen calls for theater calls for film or or Mm -hmm. other auditions. So it really is just putting together a casting call, trying to give, you know, a little bit of specificity on the character and then offering sides and it goes out and you receive the the audio back. So it's really just saying, here's the sides, here's what we're looking for, for the characters. 
send your audio in we'll listen to it and based on what everybody sends in we'll we'll kind of match it up i think the biggest thing and and i've told both charlie and ezra this was that one of the biggest ways that i selected people was once i had narrowed down to who i thought i really liked i mm-hmm. matched i matched the voices and when i heard ezra and charlie together it just the chemistry was perfect which is even crazier to think about because they're you know for all of this stuff they're recording solo we're doing remote recordings i'm not trying to do live recordings with anyone mm-hmm. so the fact that they're on their own envisioning the character but it synced up with that chemistry that's a testament to how right the fit was for the role i think it takes a whole different skill set to be able to give that like emotion inflection or chemistry to your voice when it's just you in a room reading a script into a microphone right it, yeah <laughs> That's impressive. And, and and different shows do do things different ways. There are some shows that, you know, they're they're all in the same locality, so they all record in a studio together or that, you know, they'll do live recordings, but for our purposes, you know, we have a cast member that's in Australia. There's no way we can do live recordings. Just fly everyone um, in, David, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it is much easier to sit down, have a table read let the actors get some time with that and mm-hmm. once they feel comfortable just say hey okay now take it do do a few takes and and we'll work with the audio there so speaking of auditions charlie i want to start with you i want to hear anything you'd like to share about like what made you interested in trying out for the role of javi specifically and did you try out for any other roles as well Uh, Well, my process was a little bit different because I started working for David as a sensitivity consultant for the character of Javi originally. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it really wasn't that much different to the way I approach characters because I'm very meticulous about book work and just like dissecting the script as much as possible. Um, But I did get to spend a lot of time with the character, especially just kind of in the back of my mind Mm -hmm. um, as I was working through it. And then the whole project was just super interesting to me, just partially just because of like an inclusivity Mm -hmm. kind of just because growing up, I did not see a lot of characters that like looked like me. Um, And obviously things have progressed a lot, but it was just it's different when there you see a part and you're like, oh, like I could really be that. I'm not like stretching to try and be something I'm not. So I was like, I have to go for it. Obviously it went very well because I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) But I thought the whole, sorry. I just thought the whole idea was really cool. And obviously um, there's not a lot of audio dramas that are about a subject like this. And I just think it's really neat. Yeah, that is very cool. And I imagine being a sensitivity consultant for the character specifically gave you time to get them to know the character before even auditioning. So that must have been, it's like it was created for you almost, right? That's a really <laughs> yes. cool. No, it was, it was really great because when I was working with this character and trying to make it as accurate a portrayal as possible, mm-hmm. I was really using my own experience. I was an athlete for like, I played soccer for pretty much all my life, even into like college. Um, And I'm also a Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. My family's Puerto Rican. So I was just using a lot of stuff based on my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it was just kind of a perfect character for me. Ezra, I wanted to ask you the same kind of question. What first like drew you to audition for the role of Jake? And did you audition for any other characters or did you, or did you know this is the one that you wanted? I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I don't think that I auditioned for any roles except Jake. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember seeing, I think the Twitter page went up first and then the auditions went up. But as soon as I saw the premise, I was like, I have to be in this show. I need <laughs> to be in this show. I was also an athlete growing up. Um, mm-hmm. I started playing soccer when I was four and I think I started playing baseball when I was seven, Um, was an athlete through high school. So I saw this and I was like, oh my God, it's gay. There's baseball. Like this is going to (laughs) be awesome. Like I have to do this. Um, And actually (laughs) David kind of threw me for a loop because we hit a a crowdfunding goal and he published part of my audition. (laughs) there was um, a monologue that Jake does that was part of the audition process. And David 
put it on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you feel about that, Ezra? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't go back and listen to it because I can't. I can't. Yeah. I didn't. I did not put the audio just the side. I just oh, put oh, the side. Up. Okay. Cool. The audio is not know. there. No, 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 no. I, I saw that you were going to post it. I was like, I'm not even looking at it. I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> no, I it no, 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 no. I was like, oh, buddy. <laughs> oh, mm, no. Muted hand in glove. Oh, no. I oh, no. You you. Know, it must have been fine because I got the part. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. It was it was so. perfect. I That was one of the scenes, too. I, I, that was one of those weird linchpin scenes where I knew... I named this, I, I named the show Hand in Glove, and I originally, in my head, the Smiths hit my head for some reason, for no good reason, and I hate Morrissey, I hate him so much, but <laughs> dang it if he's not like the most problematic fave I've ever had in my life. And, <laughs> um, but I think with that scene, one of the things I really got to was like, I, I remember distinctly in my head, I was like, what song would I walk up to? And I was like, I would do How Soon Is Now by the Smiths. And then I was like, wait, how in the heck would I justify that? And then I was like, well, now this is this is the scene in the show. It really, it really mostly was just like, I need these two to have some um, very cute banter. Oh, what would my walk up song be? And then I had to give the Smiths reference to the white character because it was too good to pass up. It's You know what? And Jake is so easily relatable to me because I also am kind of a losery white guy who just like has emo taste and has terrible anxiety. It all worked out perfectly for me. That's, that's, that's Jake. That's Jake Corliss. <laughs> I love that because I wanted to ask if either of you saw some of yourself in in the characters, but you naturally answered that. So it, it does seem like these are a, an excellent or perfect fit for, for both of you. Do you know if there will be a second season or is this supposed to be like, like a short series or is it still open? It, it's open. Uh, part of that is, is discussions with the cast. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big things with audio drama and, and especially for me is just, I, I really want it to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, my goal, and I've told the cast this every time, is that um, the goal is to get everybody paid at a goal rate, like sure. honest, that just flat out, and that everybody knows where every dollar spent. And that if, you know, with our crowdfunding goal, if we reach it or exceed it, mm -hmm. then I'm ready to look at season two automatically. If mm -hmm. not, then we need to have a discussion. Sure. Um, I have a full, I've, I think I've said I have like a full five season arc in my head. That being said, I'm trying to write each season to where if we ended it after any given season, it would be a complete story. So, okay. so, you know, if we decide after this first season, you know, based on how the crowdfunding goes and, and how everything shakes out and we're like, you know what, we really enjoyed this, but we just need to we can we can move on to new projects mm -hmm. then we'll leave it as is and if not and if we want to go forward then we'll keep making it um uh, but i've already you know part of talking with ezra and charlie and especially the main cast was you know hey if we if we want to continue are you in for the long run and both of them were like absolutely so <laughs> yeah definitely um especially after getting to see all of the scripts see what david has written and especially getting to do like table reads with charlie i'm in it in it <laughs> i our, our first table read was maybe the most adorable thing like i we i wrote this thing and was like oh this is kind of cute and then i heard them read it and was like oh no we're gonna break everyone's hearts oh man it's it's precious <laughs> so david when you heard what you had written actually start to come to life in a table read. Did you first, I'm sure that was amazing, but did you make any changes after that, after hearing it live? Yeah, absolutely. And it wasn't something that I, uh, I had accounted for, although I think it was in the back of my head, but especially as we got into it, um, it was a couple of people working on the show that haven't really watched baseball before. Mm -hmm. Um, there are people who, you know, just aren't as familiar with it. So when when we started reading lines, you know, either the the flow of scenes would be off or, you know, I'd have written these way too long monologues for people that didn't need to didn't need to go through all of it. Like 
it, once you start hearing it, you start understanding how comfortable is this actor going to be with this and where's the motivation and do I need to pare it down? Do I need to change things? Um, you know, one thing we talked about initially on is like, I want, I want collaboration. We built it into how I did the agreements with everyone. It's like, I want collaboration. I don't want to give that credit. Mm -hmm. And in, and in doing that, one of the other things that's come up is that in the middle of working on it, I'm listening, going, okay, before we record anything, I need to go back in and make some changes before we do a final record. So now it's it's become a thing of we're going to do the table read, then I'm going to go adjust mm -hmm. to make sure it flows correctly. Because, I mean, there's some stuff that I wrote that I was like, wow, that does not work at all when you try to speak it no. into a microphone. <laughs> and you know, David, I really respect uh, we our last table read. I was doing a scene with Yuna who plays Brit and um, <laughs> David got like half of an entire page out <laughs> of something that she was reading. He was like, you know what? It's not working. It's gone. Don't worry about it. No. It's gone. I'm deleting it immediately. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I've never been precious with my scripts. Like I'm really not. For me, it's, you know, <laughs> for, for me, especially with the words, it's, it's honestly just like, it's got to make sense and sound good. Yes. Um, just like on stage, it has to work. I remember we had an actor when I did an adaptation of Hamlet and like he had this monologue that he just could not get. Like he just, mm -hmm. he could, he was, he, he had trouble memorizing stuff to begin with, but he just was one monologue. He had just the worst time. And finally, I think we were doing like dress rehearsals. I finally looked at it and I was like, man, forget it. Just do, I was like, hack, hack. I cut it down to like four lines and was like, here we go. It makes sense just fine without it yeah. because there's no point in, in trying to push through something that's just not going to work. It's, it's not worth the trouble when you can make something sound much better. I know since David uh, came from a theater background and I did too, that it was definitely an adjustment because usually I have to rely on like my body and I can also count on it to be a tool for telling a story, trying to figure out how to do that with just my voice, especially because I found myself like in the booth, just like crazy moving around. <laughs> and in one, of, one of my auditions, I got feedback. They're like, were you just like running around? Like, what? <laughs> It was um, all good. I was just like, okay, I just have to double one. check on your setup to make sure we're okay. <laughs> And it was and it was fine. And that and that totally makes sense too. Um, you know, what's what's really fun is so Ezra knows Ezra's playing a pitcher. Mm -hmm. So as part of the sound design, Ezra has to give some kind of an effort sound for those pitches. Yeah, and oh. my recording booth is actually I live in a New York City apartment. <laughs> the recording booth is a two foot by two foot closet. <laughs> Yeah, how are we going to make the sound of a pitch effort? How are you going to how are we going to make that work? It's it's stuff like that I think in the yeah. process that that you start going, okay, wow, you know. And again, I I'll put this on record with Ezra now. If that's not working, we'll change it. We'll do something <laughs> else. Like, I was just thinking about if you have roommates or friends that come over, if there's an open door policy and you're in the closet trying to make pitcher sounds, what that must be like for Look, everyone okay. else. <laughs> this is not exactly related to this podcast, but I was recording for a different podcast last mm -hmm. night and I live with my partner and my son and my partner was in the living room playing video games and I was like, so tonight my character is getting murdered in a in a terrible way so if you could just like if, if you hear sounds don't worry about it <laughs> he was like okay i'm just gonna put headphones in um the neighbors have never like come and knocked or anything i feel like if i really got murdered they would just not care now i'm curious charlie what's your recording setup like well, I did actually used to live in a New York apartment, um, but I had my lease end while COVID was happening. So right now it's like a weird corner of my basement that is like, it's like a little alcove with like a utility shelf. And like, I've had to make so many adjustments. It's like mattress pads. Mm -hmm. And like, at this point, I am like, my head is supporting a giant blanket over the entire thing. Ooh the whole time I'm recording, but it keeps me still. 
because I literally can't move or else the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's precarious at best. <laughs> I mean, I mean, mine is literally just under a blanket at this point. <laughs> but also, like, I, I have the problem of I, I have I, that theater background ha was a huge thing to figure out mic wise mm -hmm. because I project like crazy, mm -hmm. so I will bounce all over the room. So I, my mic, my mic right now has zero gain. Wow! And I actually have to turn the <laughs> recording down. And it and it and it captures direct. I get great audio, but yeah. like I can have zero microphone on anything because otherwise it will just echo like crazy. Yeah, that is going to make the performances, which are already going to be amazing, even more amazing now that we know what the recording setups are like. <laughs> Now that we know that Ezra has to figure out how to throw a fastball in a two foot by two foot closet. It's like right? recording in a coffin. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of the cast, how big is the cast? How many cast members do you have for Hand and Glove? So we've got five main cast members. Javi and Jake are the two main characters. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a handful of bigger characters that are that are with them. And then we have Oh gosh, now I have to count the ensemble. Sorry. <laughs> um <laughs> I think I think we have about 10 or 12 um okay. in in the ensemble with smaller roles. I have to give I have to give huge credit to uh, one of my favorite audio dramas that I also got to be a part of, which was Kalila Stormfire's uh Magical Services. Especially Lizette who created that. They had such a good infrastructure on how they did recording sessions, how mm -hmm. they dealt with ensemble. And that was one of the things learning from that was like, when we do an ensemble scene, it's like, here's four lines, just give me some filler takes and we'll put it together when we sound design everything. Ready for a rules light, narrative, failing forward, collaborative storytelling, tabletop role-playing game? And sure of where to start? Powered by the Players is an actual play podcast featuring mini campaigns and one shots of all your favorite Powered by the Apocalypse games. Each campaign or one shot will be a different PBTA game with a rotating cast of diverse players. We've got Masks, a teenage superhero drama. Bluebeard's Bride, a feminist horror retelling. Monster of the Week, a supernatural mystery. Escape from Dino Island, a Jurassic Park inspired adventure. Crossroads Carnival, a depression era sideshow noir. The next game we play could be yours. So join Morgan, Kristen, and Diana, and let's power up. Follow us on Twitter at PBT Players. Subscribe on your favorite podcatcher. I'm just curious into how much prep and practice runs you do before you actually start recording, or are you recording the whole time and then you're just going to take what is the best audio. So right now, uh, we've we've done table reads for two and two third scenes. We've got nine total, so we're working through them as we go. Okay. Um, and just working with scheduling and stuff like that, figuring out how it works. Um, but typically, you know, we've done a table read for about forty five minutes, maybe an hour at most, and it'll depend on the length of the scene. Um, I know there's definitely a couple full scenes with just Ezra and Charlie that are going to be longer. We'll want that time to explore all of that. Um, and as we've gone along, I've tried to be like, okay, maybe 45 minutes is better, maybe an hour. But after that, after we do that one table read, I send out a finalized script once I've done the edits and we've talked and then say, you know, send me your takes. And we usually just do that one table read session. Um, and, you know, the I'm always open to more. I, I come from I came from a world where we rehearse things to death. But I mm -hmm. also feel like especially with with this cast, they are professionals and they get the characters so well that I feel like once we've gone through it once, they've had the chance to just have that connection mm -hmm. and hear it. And once they have that it's usually pretty easy then to just go in and do the recordings. That must be helpful then, because that means 
Ezra and Charlie, you read together. And then when you go your separate ways to your uh, coffin and your basement to record, <laughs> you can probably visual or you can probably hear the other person's voice or inflection in your head. That must help. Yeah, it helped me a lot, especially because there were times when I would hear uh, like Ezra say something for the first time out loud. And I was like, I did not even think about hearing or reading that line in that way. I need to like go back and look at that, which was really cool and really helpful. Yeah, um, table reads are amazing. And I think that Charlie just so perfectly understands Javi that it makes my performance a lot better from being able to hear it. That's very cool. Have you done, um, so you're doing table reads virtually. Mm -hmm. So what's the biggest group that you've had together to do a table read? I think we had about eight, eight or nine. The baseball scenes have, we have one scene where I think there's about 10 characters involved because it's got all the ensemble in it. Um, the only thing is that the ensemble um, because, be, because it's takes of lines and it's just like, you know, give me, give me some different takes on these different lines. I haven't required them to be at the table reads. I've been like, you're more than welcome to be invited, but the, but the timing is going to be set up with the main characters. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's a lot of, especially for the smaller roles, there's a lot of people who are like, I'll just do my takes and send them to you. Don't worry about it. Um, which is fine, you know, that they're they're outside voices in a scene so it's not like they're having a direct interaction with anyone right um and with that then they don't they don't necessarily need to to have a read time there, there's a little bit of that and I also know that as some of our schedules shift especially you know through the rest of the year I'm looking at even saying like look you know if if we need to figure out and shuffle those times. I'll work one on one with one actor and work with another one. If we can, if we can mix and match, I've started to be like, okay, I get why films go out of sequence now because we may need to do that <laughs> just because of timing and how things work. I was like, all right, we're going to do four, six, and nine. I'm going to do five on in a couple of weeks. We'll get, take care of seven whenever we can figure it out. Like, <laughs> I, it's it's become very much that thing of we're just going to do it however it needs to be done and we'll get the recordings in when we get them. Be able to do. So I do want to talk about the crowdfunding project, which is actually live right now. We'll obviously link it in the show notes so that everyone listening can go and support it either by pledging um, and or by sharing it with friends. Can you tell me a little bit about the crowdfunding projects? Absolutely. Um, like I said, part of the part of the deal with audio drama is that I want it to be a sustainable project, mm -hmm. which really just means everybody who's involved in it should be getting paid and should be getting credit. There has been, you know, over the years, this has started to grow into a genre and an actual sort of industry as part of the bigger entertainment groups. And, you know, to the point where they've got a writer's guild, there's more and more, you know, larger names getting involved in it. Marvel's done an audio drama at this point. Uh, Orphan Black just had one come out. There's lots and lots of growing interest in that. Part of that is just figuring out how you're going to do your business. And from my end, it really just boils down to I'm treating it a lot like I used to treat theater projects, which is just we want to be able to pay the people for the time they put in mm -hmm. at a rate we all agree on. So the crowdfunding, it's on Indiegogo. Um, our first goal is trying to raise about $3,000. That's raising a rate that we've already talked to the different actors and the crew and everybody that covers just all the expenses for the crowdfunding and the rate, the goal rate that we've discussed with that. At $4,000, we also would then be bringing on a sound designer. Specifically, I, I'm ready to take that task on, but mm -hmm. if we can bring somebody in that specializes with that, that's a huge boost um, and a help for the show to have somebody who can specialize, really look at all that different stuff. And then from there, I've got some ideas, mm -hmm. but I'll be honest, it's a busy crowdfunding season for audio drama. There are a lot of shows that are crowdfunding right now. We're boosting all of them too. They're all awesome shows. There's sci-fi, there's 
fun ghosty things there's all sorts of fun different shows that are, that are crowdfunded so we know we're one among many from my end it's really just if we can look at those goals and reach them that's what we're looking at first and we can go from there we've got fun perks we have very fun perks i've got stuff that you know you can get a sticker for the team at our lowest levels you get a newsletter uh, we have baseball cards that are being designed currently of four Javi and Jake's characters um, from the same artist that did our logo design. So um, they're going to be printed on like an actual kind of old 70s card stock, and then they'll come in a sleeve. So you'll get those shipped. Um, if you raise at a certain level, you get a baseball with the team logo for the team that uh, they belong to. And then um, I also have one very, very special Hall of Fame tier, which is if you have the money at $2,500, I will attend any baseball game with you of your choice. David, what I'm if it's a committed. team you hate? I don't, I, whatever. <laughs> Even if it's the St. Louis Cardinals, I don't care. I will still sit down and watch that baseball game. I will complain about it loudly, yes. but I will watch. That feels fair, right? You should think about the yes. game. You're just you're just there. Will you the colors or the team you're going to watch even if you don't like them? No. No. Okay, okay. I just wanted to know. I just feel like the audience needs to know where we draw the line. Now we know. So, David, I noticed that on Twitter that for every new contributor, you are writing one sentence in a long thread which is great because that means you have a lot of contributors so far so tell mm -hmm. me more about that um i put out a challenge it was like okay if any a sentence to this story is not baseball writing a yeehaw gay rodeo and honestly this is as i go along i am yeah. not planning this at all is added to it as it goes if more people contribute we get more of the story you can follow the show at glovecast you can follow me at big macinpod m-a-c-i-n-p-o-d um i also work on a set of shows um with diana lorraine called macintosh and mod we talk about ponies movies and riverdale so if you are interested in or loathe any of those things you are more than welcome to listen because we frequently yell about them even though we secretly love them um you can follow that twitter at macintosh mod it's super fun as well charlie how about you all right um on twitter you can actually follow me it's s-r-r-y underscore c-h-r-l-i-e like sorry charlie <laughs> thought that was cute it is. Uh, but now that i'm it saying is. it out loud it feels awkward so. no it's adorable <laughs> or you can follow me on in, uh on instagram at charlieboy underscore pacheco ezra how about you um similarly embarrassing my twitter handle <laughs> is at the real han yolo <laughs> <laughs> and you can hear me as a series regular on the second season of the sheridan tapes they're also um their sister podcast um tales of the echo wood is crowdfunding right now and that's gonna be pretty neat but um yeah you can hear me there season two and i will be on the next season as well hey amber here i would like to thank you so much for listening to tabletop babble tabletop crowd and tabletop spotlight all the tabletop things that we have going on here lately for show news, announcements, updates, and all that jazz, you can follow us on Twitter at Tabletop Babble. Also, it would be really, really helpful if you left us a rating and review on iTunes. Oh, it's no longer iTunes. I mean Apple Podcasts. Yeah, that thing, Apple Podcasts. Please leave a rating or review there. It really does help the show out a lot. Anyway, thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Bye!